Hi there, welcome to another episode of Camera Peeps. Uh, joining us once again is our colleague Andre. Good day, David. How are you? Good, thank you. Now, today we are singling out uh, this, the topic you specialise in, which is videotapes and old videotapes particularly. Uh, what have we got here, Andre? We've got a two inch quadruplex tape here you pictured. Um, these we used, this is the, one of the earliest forms of videotape recording. And basically uh, the TV stations recorded for many years, starting from around about 1960 up until probably the earlier 80s. They started using this format to record most television shows, sporting events. So in the US, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm just um, challenging my uh, TV history memory here. <laughs> But the Americans pretty much came up with this two-inch tape they system. They did, yeah. There Ampex? Was, yes, Ampex was one of the big pioneers in this, and, and, and RCA it, was another big company. But Ampex, I think, correct me if I'm wrong once again, uh, A, the A, the M, and the P were someone's initials, I think, and they added X that is for, correct, for excellence yeah. or something. That's how that came about. I can't about. remember the... I think that's American yeah. something. I just can't remember. And, and of course, this, this um, totally revolutionised things in the US because, because of the East Coast and West Coast. It was orig originally developed for time shift recording from New York to Los Angeles and they simply, uh, there was, the time difference was so great that they had to somehow work out a way of, instead of redoing the whole show for a different market, a way of recording it. They had experimented earlier with fixed head recorders, but uh, the tape speed required was incredibly high and it was a very hard thing to manage. So. The Ampex people were one of the people that developed, or I believe the ones that developed the rotary heads, which meant that they could slow the tape speed down and they could get a very good picture out of it. And because the big stars at the time, I know certainly in radio, your Bing Crosby's and your Bob Hopes, they actually used to do many live shows for the different time zones in that the US. That is correct, yes. So this totally changed everything. That's right, and there was the six to eight hour time difference, so they needed some way to shift these recordings without having to do the whole show again. So by doing that, they were able to time shift as we know it today and play the tape later mm. as if it were live in another city. So it was quite successful but it had to be done. So there was further developments made because originally it was a time shift recording medium but many other uses came out of it. Yeah well shows were basically mastered. That's right and they were able to actually re-edit things mm. and in the early days of editing they had to physically splice the tape like a film and then as the technology improved they were able to electronically edit it from tape to tape and it became virtually frame accurate. And it would have uh, saved the TV stations, the networks money because they were kinescoping everything so the live shows were That's the other so, thing too. So it would have been a huge film budget because just to record everything. Yeah, yeah. Prior to that film costs were enormous and they had to keep running the film to keep up with the tape and the film got scratched, um, it was very hard to duplicate. Mm -hmm. And there was a few other problems as well. Okay, so uh, here's another shot of a, a two-inch tape, and uh, this is from your uh, collection as well. That is correct. This would have been a uh, spot reel, they called them. It was only about 10 minutes, that one, and that would have been for commercial transfers. So they would have recorded commercial pro programs on there mm -hmm. to replay later to air in television stations. So they might have had like a, a whole break recorded on that, depending on how the network structured it. Structured its needs. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these were also run off a cartridge system which was also that tape put into like a cassette but uh, that, that was uh, soon replaced by another more elaborate system later on. Okay now I've chosen this photo here um, because of the, um, the freight stickers on the, on, the, on the box here so freight was uh, Yes, well the other thing, being on videotape, it was quite easy to shift it from state to state because back in those days there was uh, not a very sort of consistent way of getting vision from one state to another. There was, uh, the car actual cable came along in the early 60s which meant they could send programs live up and down but it didn't leave any room for any other transfer so the videotapes were very good for shuffling pre-recorded shows from state to state. And I think this was also the uh, the 1970s and the early 1980s was also the glory days of the um, post-production facilities because they were basically sending off dubs of commercials to all the regional and, and capitals. Yes, I used to actually work in an area that did that for a while. We used to uh, run off a commercial. We might have to do 30 different dubs of the commercial, which would have to be cut down and sent off to all the regional television stations as there was no networking as such back then. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Now these tapes, 
are getting a bit old. Um, now, you can't just throw this onto the, the machine. Now, most people bake cakes. <laughs> in this, if you work in this area here, you actually have to bake these tapes to get them to a certain... Well, the problem with the video tapes is they absorb moisture over time. And the term baking simply means that you're absorbing the moisture out of the tape so that you can replay it. Um, in most cases that does happen over time. The other problem is the oxide will shred off the tape. And, uh, usually, and the biggest problem is when it goes past the video heads, the heads dig out the oxide and it causes what they call a head clog, which means okay. the picture disappears. And you have to patiently go back and try and do it again and uh, see if you can resolve the problem. Okay, now you mentioned oxide. I think there was uh, an industry joke with film people um, who, you know, my area left TV so they could go and particularly work in film and I think there was a joke about the difference between film and tape and one records onto rust and the other one records onto silver so therefore... <laughs> you you, you find that hot. the film people detested the videotape era because of the lack of resolution. Yeah. But Again, the videotapes are very convenient for doing quick dubs, shifting mm -hmm. things around, instant replay, no developing, so you had to really weigh it up. For television, mm -hmm. videotape was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. For the rest of the industry, the film was the quality and the medium they used. So are there many machines around that still play back these two-inch tapes? Uh, as far as the two-inch tapes go, very little resources. It's mm -hmm. very difficult, mm -hmm. as is with a lot of the tape technology. The people, the, these people that pioneered this mm -hmm. system, there's really very few now that are left that can actually do it. Mm, okay. I actually remember seeing in a documentary on um, the Vietnam War, um, they actually had a two-inch machine in the back of a DC-3. And we're actually transmitting live pictures out of the DC-3 for the troops for morale, yeah. so they could actually show, show TV shows. That would have been a is. probably obviously a very portable machine, which wouldn't have been very portable, I might add. No, well, I don't think the the story wasn't so much about the tape machine; it was the fact that um, they could do it. DC-3 would yeah. could fly so slowly that it was slow enough to transmit the signal. Which that would have been incredible at the time. Absolutely, yeah. So, and that would have been the maximum size reel, 10 minutes that would have fitted on that machine. Yeah, okay, fair enough. All right, so just um, moving along in terms of uh, technology. Okay, by about the 19, well, even in the 1960s, they were developing and trying to get the tape small in there. This is a one inch tape. This is half the width and half the size, and this is only about five minutes. So to Sony pioneered the one inch or? Uh, I'm not really too sure okay. who pioneered that, but uh, a few different companies were trying to work on it. It's all about getting things smaller and more compact. Mm -hmm. So the one inch system was developed originally in the late 60s or around about that time once the, they could miniaturise the electronics more, but it wasn't very good quality. It didn't have the quality of the two inch. But also with the two inch, you couldn't picture search. Such no, period. that's something I'll get to. Yeah, okay, um, no the, the format, the one inch format was developed more and more. Now the machine that's pictured here now, that came out uh, about 1979, 1980, and this revolutionised the one inch tape format. So they had an A, B and C tape format. This is a C format machine, and this uh, had the ultimate quality, and it was really very comparable with the two inch, if not comparable. So the big advantages of the one inch system were the fact that you could pause the picture and get a still frame and in this case this machine has what they call AST or dynamic tracking heads which meant that you could get a clean still frame and slow motion capabilities. The two inch machine because of the layout of the quadruplex heads it couldn't give a still picture it couldn't do any picture searching, nothing like that. So the one inch machine was quite an improvement on that and you got extra audio channels. Okay. The two inch machine only really had one audio channel. Some stereo machines were brought out towards the end of its useful life, but the one inch machine was far superior for all these things. And this particular machine actually resides? This machine came out of a working TV environment. It used to record broadcast television shows. But that's actually that photo is actually taken in the spare room. That is actually uh, one of the machines I have, yeah. and uh, I have several of these. It is working, yeah, yes, fantastic. and it was only just working the other day, so it, it is still in functioning condition. But uh, it's a limited amount of time that we'll be able to keep these things running due to the fact that there's no spare parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is another. Uh, I guess variation of, of 
Sony, I guess in this case, just trying to make things smaller and more this efficient. Is, yep, this is a, a well-developed Umatic system. This was uh, developed in the very late 60s, getting into about 1970. I didn't realise it was that old. It is. Okay. <laughs> uh, the original machines were top-loading, and the tapes went into the machine, dropped down inside. This is what they call a front-loading, mm -hmm. so it could be put in a rack with other machines, because you normally wanted more than one. Um, this was the first of the video cassette systems that became commercially available. This particular, we should just point and out, this particular machine is SP. This was actually the last. It is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this was like, this was the last of the machines. So after that, they really gave up and developed. So this is the tape that went in. This was actually a portable tape. And David, you'd remember when you were a cameraman at, uh, at nine, you'd go yeah. and well, well, look at shoot chance. on this and I'd get the tape and uh, put it in the editing machine and edit the stories I off know. it. Well, I hope Channel 9 so. don't send their security guards around <laughs> to retrieve the tape. But what happened, and it will sound strange now because everyone has uh, video capability on their phones, but back in the 80s, um, a lot of people didn't have video cameras. Or if they did, they weren't particularly good. But as ca news camera guys, we actually had, because we were on call, we actually had the car with the gear in it. And our bosses, just so long as we had their blessing, we were allowed to use the, the gear for you know 21st or family weddings or events, whatever. We did have their blessing and that is why I still have these tapes. Um, so there's nothing shifty going on there, but it's to me, there's, I've digitized everything, um, but I think that's got someone's uh, wording or something on there. Oh, um, yeah, it looks like it. But so. it is digitised, but I still struggle to actually but throw it out because it's... it's well, this, this system actually went for about 20 years successfully and it was used in the uh, industrial level of things and in broadcast it was still being used even into the 90s in some companies. So it, it lasted pretty well, well but... Well, I digitised that uh, about four or five years ago from one of your machines that you kindly yeah. loaned me um, and there was a little bit of breakup at the beginning of the tape but apart from that it was actually um, pretty, yeah, pretty look, good. If the tapes are kept in good condition they can generally last a while it's the machinery to play it back yeah. becoming well, the, the issue. The weird thing is I didn't really I hadn't really gone out of my way to look after those tapes they were pretty much stored in the garage so I've got all the fluctuations in temperature I and they still actually pl played pretty well, mm. better than the SP tape, uh, the beta cam, which we'll get onto in a minute. Okay. So um, here's just another shot of the. Um, the yeah, that, that's a. Uh, this was the 20 minute one, and the one that you see pictured there is the 60 minute. Now they both fitted in the same machine, but you got an extra 40 minutes on the bigger tape. So my recollection of the Channel 9 days were the bigger tapes were for the master edits. So you guys used to black the tape. I think that's correct and then yeah. the stories were just backed up that is correct we insert edited onto a, yeah. a tape okay yes. and that then meant that gave flexibility between the vision and the audio whilst editing yeah and then so I'll just go back one and then in uh, when the news went to air there were basically a row of these machines yeah we had six of those yeah. um, even though I was an editor I sometimes yeah. had the job of putting the machines to wear and we used to run down the corridor with seconds yeah. to go after editing and push it into the machine and off we went and then my recollection was so the sequence was you would hit uh, local control I you think, would give the, it up, yes the, the machine then remote, remote and then the director in the correct. studio actually and, rolled it and sometimes out. we had to manually yeah. roll and just listen out for the cue but I remember at the time uh, because I think the other networks had actually switched Channel 9 actually hung on to this system for a long time um, but a lot of the other networks had put the beta cart yeah, there was in. an automatic beta cart, which was basically four yeah. of these in another format. You could actually get it for that format. But, but I think the the uh, thinking at the time was that this was actually a fairly good system. It was a, it was it actually was, quite reliable. It was simple and flexible. Yeah, that was the whole point. And yeah. you could get things up and running on air very quickly, and that was the whole success of that system. Okay, and then once again, I rec recall that inside the cassette there was. There was a um, bit of paper, and you guys wrote That's the right. story we had duration the duration. The outcue and the duration of the story. And the initials of the editor. Correct. I think, yes. And I think there's a lot of mine in there. <laughs> okay, right, okay. So um, that's back to that shot there. So that's the one hour you said? That's that one is hour. one hour, yeah. As, as in KSP 60, KSP yep. was the grade of the tape, yep. and 60 was the minutes it recorded for. Was you got a little bit more than that, but 60 was the conservative. That was the long, time. 60 minutes was the longest. No, they came out with 75 oh, minutes, but okay. the tape was so thin that often it would stretch and oh, okay. uh, 
And a lot of machines, the time. if the machine wasn't up to scratch, okay. it would damage the tape. And I must say, at Channel Line, we had an excellent maintenance department. We headed by did, John Bremer, yeah. and it was amazing that basically... Genius. Yeah, when <laughs> the guys, when they were um, doing maintenance on these machines, they didn't just fix a capstan or just fix a roller. They basically rebuilt it. would spend a, They basically, a, like a car engine, yeah. they stripped it down, replaced all the things that needed yeah. to be replaced, yeah. and the machinery ran perfectly. Well, I think that's probably why these machines still work in 2018. That's probably why. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so moving up to another format here. Um. Okay, well this is a VHS now. This was this is a professional machine, but VHS in the late seventies started to become into the home consumer market. Now, even though this is a professional machine, it's the same format, and then the format also developed into an SVHS, which was like a, a higher grade of recording. But even though the tapes were the same, the recordings were different. So, this was when the home market started to get competitive with. Mm -hmm with these systems and there's also a Betamax picture there which um which we'll go to its competitor with, with VHS. yeah, yeah okay. if we can go to that right and that's the that's the competitor that's a Betamax machine now David I believe that you purchased one of these at well, some stage well that machine actually well you're the custodian of it now um <laughs> but this I convinced my parents to buy this machine in 1986 I convinced them that it was the better format and we knew at the time that the the video high places actually did have more movies more titles in vhs but i said no this this is a better machine and it has hi-fi it has really good audio yeah. um so i convinced my parents that was the way to go and as you know well, oh, well, we've got like the original receipt out. there for this it. is the original receipt from 1986 and it is for $1,200 so in today's money, we're probably talking about five thousand dollars just I, to buy something to record off the TV. I hate to think, but <laughs> my my mother particularly would be very happy <laughs> knowing that it hasn't been thrown out. No, it's, and it's still, still getting there. used. Well, this is what started the domestic mm. market off was the VHS and the Betamax. Now, the Betamax, you've got a hi-fi one. The earlier ones didn't have any no. hi-fi, and the sound was very ordinary. But that format led into the broadcasting area, which if we go to the next picture, as you can see there, all these different formats were developed from the Betamax system, which originally the Betamax was a smaller version of the Umatic. So they'd simply have made the same technology into a smaller cassette. So that was very attractive, especially to... Well, I think um, yeah, one of the camcorders machine, is, is Yeah, well, that made it very attractive to the, uh, and the camcorder market. And, and that... The grey cassette on the right hand yep, the very side of the photo would go into that. That is correct. That is there. the first of the broadcast formats using Beta Max, but they called it Beta Cam, mm. which was the professional version of it. So it meant that the tape ran through faster. So, in fact, that 30-minute beta cam would run three and a half hours on the normal domestic machine but because it's going so fast you only get 30 minutes so that was the start of the the, the new wave of uh, broadcasting tapes and as you can see there it developed into can i just stop for yeah, a second sure. there i remember some sony marketing at the time a glossy brochure and it was about now we had camcorders basically or they were available and there's actually a photo i'd, I'd love it if someone had a copy of it because it was actually amazing basically a guy on a hang glider with one of those beta cams mounted so it was basically to say we can get a whole videotape camera before yeah. <laughs> you know into the well prior to that the umatic system there was no hope of you had to have a separate recorder with a cable going to the camera oh, no that was my when era. this format came out as in this one here mm. this tape would fit inside the camera which was quite amazing mm. and uh, you'd get broadcast quality so that meant that the tape could come straight out of the camera and go in and be edited so that was that was revolutionarily good anyway as time went on they realized they could improve it so they came out with the beta cam sp which was superior play or better quality which i think we've got one here and um, that's uh the gray, yep, the gray that's, case that's it yep so it looks just the same but yep. that was just simply a, a higher grade of another, recording another home movie on 
Um, then they moved into the next, which SP came along. Then they moved into the fact that, well, we've got this great machine, can we get more tape out of it? So then a larger tape format was developed. That meant you could get 90 minutes instead of just 30. So that was the SP advantage. And then of course it progressed from there and then it became digital beta cam, which then started to replace the one inch tape machine, which meant that you didn't have to have these open reels. You could record as good as this onto this if not better it was digital you didn't lose quality when you were dubbing and on it went and you had a lot more flexibility and then as time went on the digital beta, beta cam became hd beta cam and now we pretty much don't use video tape so that lasted that format developed quite significantly in a 20 year period i think there will be people watching this who will um have memories of all those yeah formats. and even today yeah. most of those tapes play really well and uh it has in, you know, the, the tapes still pop, pop, pop up mm. from archives and they've lasted quite well. And until recent years, they were still using it as an archiving source. Yeah, okay. So it's it's done pretty well for itself, that system. Yeah, good. Um, what have we got here? Oh, this is just a shot of a... That's SX. a um, SX beta cam. That was uh, a grade under the, it's only standard definition, but uh, that was a grade under the digital beta cam. This was like a halfway point it was digital but it wasn't digital beta cam but i so. do also recall um the head life and because what appealed to the tv stations was um the head life they got a couple of thousand hours i think out of the yeah, heads and, on those machines and you got double the tape time as well yeah, okay, so yeah. uh what what could be 90 minutes in a digital beta cam or sp actually became three hours in one of those so that's that's a fair amount of time and of course you could actually use sp tapes in you that could machine, yes yeah. it would play back those yeah. they're all backwards compatible those machines they could play back uh, even right to the early mm -hmm. first generation up to they, they couldn't play back digital beta cam but it could do mm -hmm. any that format back and so, you have one of these machines? Oh, I've got several yours. of those machines, Great. yes. Nice to know. Um, okay, so once again, the spare room at your place, Andre? Yeah, that's that's just a rack that I use. That also incorporates uh, a couple of other formats. So there's a Video 8 format, which uh, is another sort of smaller than this. It's about a third the size of this again, which is basically the same operation, but it was made smaller. But it wasn't very successful because it had a lot of problems with quality dropout and they even got to a digital format in that video 8 but that rack is capable of paying back and dubbing all those formats we've just seen okay now that's a great segue to um, now 2018 um, I have digitized all my tapes because I have the means to but we are recommending uh, to anyone any uh, agency or TV person or whatever that has these tapes lying around that they actually digitise them before it's too late? Is that fair Well, say? it's more the fact that we can't, the machines can't be get, get, kept going forever. Mm. And I would say if you want to do it, do it now. Yeah. Because every year it just gets that much harder. So you basically, I mean, check with uh, you first, but you do have, apart from two inch, you have most machines. I have most formats I can yeah. cover, yeah. domestic and professional. Yeah. Um, the, the most people request that they put on either USB sticks, hard drives, Yep. to sort of store it and then they make their own arrangements it can be captured in different formats mm -hmm. depending on what space you want to take up on your hard drive mm -hmm. or what the quality of the original is but you basically have a service where someone can bring basically, the tape yes we can digitize it onto a hard drive or a vimeo correct. link private link or something like that, that is correct back, back it it up, be, so, so that's yep. great no i i mean i found with um tv industry people they can be a little bit belligerent about paying because we came from a culture where we didn't have to pay. You know, we could just go in after the news and do a dub or whatever. But um, it just can't be a free service because this stuff, the electricity alone well, to run those machines. It's not just that, it's the fact that uh, it is time consuming. Yes. And uh, there are a lot of other factors. I mean, if the tapes haven't been well looked after, there's other contributing factors that may mean that you get head clogs and other problems which slow down the process. So it, it is a major consideration, but it's a consideration you have to look at because in the near future, you won't be able to do it. What's well, a bit of a crunch decision really people have to make. Is, it is. Is, is the footage that important to you? If, if you, you want it, save it. You better do it sooner rather than later. Every year, it just gets harder and harder. Yeah. Okay, well, look, I think uh, we'll wrap it up there, Andre. Oh. Um, but that's a great um, video there. I hope people enjoy that. And, I hope they um, do too. <laughs> um, so, and on behalf of all of us TV industry people, thank you for um, going to the effort of retrieving these machines because I think some of them literally 
were in the dump or very close, one step away from the dump Well, master. I retired from service, yeah. a lot of them, and they had to be restored by myself or other people that I had yeah. to engage and, to do it. And you had the foresight to grab them, and, and it is, uh, I guess it's an encumbrance on, you know, your living space as well, so, you know, we do appreciate yeah. that you've... Well, it's, it's a case of uh, people sort of like tend to hang on to the tapes and not the machinery and think everyone's going to have one but mm -hmm. as it's turned out a lot of people have the tapes and there's nothing to play them on so but it's useless yeah but also i find that you know now we're in this hd world and you know 4k to a point as well but the other thing it is standard def it's not critical if there's a dropout or whatever it just doesn't it's not actually that hard to digitize this stuff as long as it's watchable i yeah. think people if it's old they accept that and that's it's having something is better than having nothing mm. okay all right thanks for uh, coming right. on pleasure Andre, and right. uh, i think we'll be catching up with you again some all right more videos mm. okay thank you